Hey guys, Henning and Morten here for Flip Normals. This is a very special video where we are gonna do a cool breakdown of one of our products on the Flip Normals marketplace. Mm -hmm. This is made by a friend of ours, uh, Damien, who I used to work with at NPC back in the day. Oh yes. <laughs> we, uh, we used to work for as uh, sculptors together. I was texturing and he was modeling and vice versa. Mm. So he has uploaded this super awesome asset of a dinosaur, which we, which is uh, which has the seabirds model, the topology, and uh, the maps as well, the color maps. It's a what was it? A stick stickosaurus, stickacosaurus, stirrocosaurus. Yeah, that apparently. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> my my dinosaur knowledge is not really up to up to par. I'm a little, little, little bit disappointed. With that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to go through this asset here. We're going to show you the seabirds file, the yeah. Mari uh, ma maps, and the. Um, model in Maya. So let's just get started with this in ZBrush. Like the, the reason behind this is uh, it's not so much to sell this product, but more as a how we would break it down for, for visual effects kind of, like mm. how we would use this asset in, in visual effects. And I think this is probably one of the highest quality assets we have in the store currently. And I'm super thrilled to have it because it, it it's just an awesome asset, to be honest. Yeah, this is the closest asset I've seen outside of VFX, which mimics the quality we worked with in VFX. Yeah. So it's pretty rare that you actually get to see this kind of stuff. Yeah. So the very first thing I would say when it comes to looking at these kind of things is if whenever you you're looking at this, zoom out <laughs> and just look at look at the model as almost like silhouette view or like or at least where all the details are removed. Yeah, People tend to go way too crazy on details way too early. Mm. And that just means that you you are not going to be thinking about the fundamentals. Yeah, if you've watched any of our previous videos, you know we've talked a lot about um, mid-frequency sculpting. And even from this distance, like all the high-frequency stuff, like all the pores and scales and that kind of stuff is is not really visible here. But we do still see the mid-frequency. You know, we see the, the bigger folds on the stomach, on the tail, the ribs, you know, that, that kind of... That kind of detail is what you spot from here. So if this is tight at this level, then any sort of high frequency detail you put on top is just gonna, you know, make it shine even more. Yeah, and it's gonna be way easier to do as well. Yeah. Because then now you have form to indicate it. And specifically we did a video where like Morton said about mid-frequency, where we show like a tile pattern yeah. over something which had mid-frequency and not, and it's just so much easier. Yeah. But you can also see the first thing we're seeing here though, and instead of even like these folds, is how clean the silhouette is. Here. Yeah. You know, like it's just so nice and you know, let's yeah. just add a bit. <laughs> almost, almost there. You know, you can just see the shapes, the curves, they go into each other, and it's just a nice, good shape. Yeah, it's actually it's really simple when you break it down. Um, which is really nice because it, it means that you're not really distracted in terms of the form. It, it conveys exactly what it needs to and it, it's actually very simple. Yeah, this is what you see from the better the better sculptor you are, the better the clean shapes are. Yeah. And the more noobish you are, the more stuff, the silhouette here will be broken up and all sorts of crazy stuff will happen. Yeah, I mean, you can obviously have, you know, spikes going off the back to, to break up the silhouette. It's not that the silhouette has to be like one clean line. No. But, you know, with this kind of dinosaur, it kind of has to. Yeah, exactly. And even if you do have the spikes going out, it would still be controlled. Yeah. It would still, it would still add to the feeling of it. And then we're seeing these lines here, like what we're more and more talking about before. This, this is like pretty clear mid frequency. Yeah. And this is something you gotta sculpt by hand. All these lines here you're seeing, it's like if you were to blur this photo or this image, you, you can do this, take a print screen of this, take it into Photoshop and blur it. Yeah. And you would see what we're talking about. All this stuff here is all sculpted by hand. Like all this stuff here. Yeah. And then of course, all the high stuff here, this is all just maps. Yeah, no, all that stuff is icing on the cake and like, honestly, you don't want to do that by hand. No. The mid-frequency mid stuff, yes, but all the scales, all the tiny stuff you know, around the eyes and around the horns and that kind of stuff, you, you don't want to do that by hand because you're going to be spending four months yeah. just doing uh, one <laughs> one dinosaur, basically. And particularly if somebody asks you, hey, can you change the frequency? You're going like, uh, no. Oh, shit. <laughs> that is impossible because then yeah. you got to do everything by hand again. So if you would maybe sculpt, is like this kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure how Damien did this, but this could be maybe an alpha as a base yeah. and then sculpt it up. Or maybe it's like a VDM brush yeah. or something like that. It kind of looks like it could be an alpha. Yeah, for exactly. This stuff. But this is, like the, this is like the smallest stuff I would sculpt by hand. Yeah. Yeah, what you could do is you could have uh, maybe an alpha to drag out the base and then 
go in and sculpt on top of it to sort of emphasize it a little bit. Yeah, that's a really good way of doing it because otherwise you you might have everything might have the same depth of it. Yeah. But if you go in here and you start sculpting it properly, then you could you could take like a more tileable pattern and really break it up with different levels of depth. Yeah, you can see that right here that it's actually you have all this detail that's around here, um, pretty much the same frequency. Uh, but then right here, you know, it, there's there's this one bump there, one bump there, and one bump there that adds that actually adds variation and helps break it up. So it's a lot easier for your eye to focus. The same thing with these bigger uh, bulges here. It just breaks up the detail nicely. You like look at the frequency here. It's a little smoother there, surrounded by the bigger bumps. Yeah, it's really important that you you put some hierarchy in yeah. your in your frequency yeah sure everything still needs coverage because otherwise it's, it's gonna look completely smooth but it's really important that you you directing the viewer where you want to look for instance on these folds here there's less of the of like the scaly stuff yeah of like the crocodile skin yeah you couldn't have that with this uh, that kind of skin because it drew the way that it droops uh, immediately gives off the feeling that this is a soft tissue mm. um, that's very sort of malleable. So you wouldn't have it be stiff with scales on top, probably. No, exactly. We One thing as well, which is I think is interesting here, this is a question we've had a lot, particularly when we've been teaching character modeling, is what parts should be in the same mesh and what parts should be separate? Mm. And that's a really good question. Because you know, if you're doing a dinosaur like this or a dragon or whatever it might be, yeah, should you should this these spikes be connected to the body or yeah. shouldn't they? And it's actually like you'd be surprised how often we get this question. But it's, it I think it's just one of those fundamental questions where you it, it's just hard to figure out in the beginning. Like if you're doing shoes, do I make the laces part of the shoe? Mm. And I th the answer we always give people is if it's separate in real life, then separate it in your mesh. There are instances where you can attach it, like. Like on this dinosaur, for example, the tongue is part of the mesh, but maybe for some reason, in some cases, you could have the tongue be uh, a separated mesh, for example. Exactly. Look at this beautiful tongue. At least I think it's part of the the same mesh. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it is. And, but this is also this is also where it gets tricky because yes, if it's a part of the same mesh, I keep it the same. But here it's separate. Yeah. And why is that? Because technically, I guess you know it is connected because it grows out of it. Yeah, exactly. It's it's still a part of the skeleton with this. Yeah. But honestly, one of the reasons you would do this is because it's significantly easier. And in this case, you see, you have this like lip around it. You have mm -hmm. like a clear separation point. If this here was was just in one flush mesh, yeah, I would keep it as the same one, like some kind of dragon designs. So you mm -hmm. have this, where it's there isn't any flesh. It's just bone sticking out. Then it would keep in the same one. But when there is like a clear separation element like this, yeah. you see this as a blessing. Now you could you could argue that like down by the beak, I guess it's a beak. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's uh, a beak. Um, you could say, okay, maybe that lip there, if that was a little more pronounced, you could maybe have the beak be separate. But because it also deforms the mouth, keeping it as one mesh might be better in this instance. Yeah, exactly. So this is this is based on more personal preference, what you want to do. I find this kind of stuff to be... Yeah. I re I'm really happy whenever I can separate this kind of stuff out. Yeah. Because this stuff here can honestly be a real pain in us to do when it comes to like topology and UVs and stretching and... Yeah, any anytime you have stuff that protrudes or if it's like maybe it's the eye or something, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the eye and the eyeball be part of the same mesh like ever. No. Even though technically in the body, you know, everything's connected. But it's just those places like Henning pointed out where you have like a very clear defined border that separates two two objects, uh, you would probably separate that out. Yeah, particularly here if this needs to move. Like, yeah. you know, the eye needs to move. You can't do this as one piece, no. even though like technically it is connected. <laughs> yeah. We also have a meniscus here as well. This is, uh, this is an area which particularly game developers went crazy over a few years ago. Yeah, it was all the rage. All game <laughs> characters like three or four years ago always looked like they were crying. Yeah. Like all the time because uh, for some reason game devs suddenly discovered this. That's not, not, no, no shit on game devs, but it's just kind of a funny observation. Yeah. So the, the, what this is going to be used for is you are going to make this into like a glass shader or liquid shader. Yeah. So that it looks like you have like a, it's like a wet line around it. And without this, it looks really weird. And with yeah. it, it looks really awesome. Yeah, it just helps to settle the eye in the, you know, in the eyeball, or the exactly. eyeball in the eye. And one thing I like here as well, Dan has done is, uh, I'm not entirely sure if it's intentional, is that it's a bit wobbly. Yeah. And keeping it wobbly means it looks more like liquid and not just like a, like a sharp mm. milled thing from metal, yeah. steel mill or something. 
So you can see, you know, all these these wrinkles going down here as well, all sculpted by hand. Yeah, and like with with stuff like this, you know, you have a good clean topology. It enables you to sculpt a lot eas more easily. And then, you know, with nice um, sort of secondary forms or mid frequency, it's very easy for you to then add the high frequency details on top. Yeah, exactly. And a little tip for you from Damien is that you put a star on top and you hide it and you name it whatever it's named. Because <laughs> otherwise, if you delete this one and you save it as a tool, yeah. then the top one here, the top sub tool, is going to have the name of the saved file. Which is quite annoying. Yeah, exactly. I prefer I prefer to save as tools and then, you know, you've got to rename it all the time. Yeah. Slight little tip for you. One thing here which you're noticing as well is you might have been screaming at the screen being like, why aren't you acknowledging the high frequency details? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to do that now. So high frequency details like this is super important for the overall realism. We keep, it's almost like we keep shitting on high frequency details because we keep talking about, oh, you know, we need to focus on the, the fundamentals first, the gesture, the silhouette, the mid frequency and all that. Yes. But once that's done, now you just have to focus on the high frequency. And honestly, high frequency detail is not that hard. No. And it like, and that's not like to be arrogant or anything. It's more like the better you do your job uh, on the first and secondary forms, the easier the tertiary, like the high frequency will be. Yeah. yeah, obviously it depends on the maps and the alphas that you're using, and that can make the result better. But it, it's really, it's like the... The cream on top. Yeah. That's the high frequency stage. And I, you know, we don't talk about it that often just because, especially in the beginning, this is what it's very easy for your eye to latch onto. And you think this is what makes a good sculpt good. Where in reality, it just enhances what's underneath it. Yeah, exactly. So, like, one that are like cream on top, turns out cream is also pretty important to whatever delicious. it is you're doing and delicious. <laughs> so, it's not to say it's not important because no. it is. If you have this sculpt without all any of this high frequency, it's gonna look stylized. Yeah, it's gonna look like a kid's toy. But when you when you have all these uh, these high frequency bits here along with the the, the low and the mid frequency, yeah. then it's really going to shine. Like all three sort of like uh, low, mid, and high frequency details, all of them are equally important because yes. they all add to the realism. Um, it's not that one is more important than the other, but the better you do your job at the lower levels, the better your, your end result is going to be. Yeah, exactly. It's like there is an order to things, mm -hmm. and that order is really important. The one thing which is cool is that when it comes to these kind of high frequency here, you can do them in ZBrush or you can do them in Mari. Yeah. Or regardless of what you do, you can always keep sculpting them up. Like, you know, you can go in here and you can really, like, start to enhance some of these these things here just to really break them up you mm. can go in with a damn standard brush and just really carve in new patterns here yeah and this kind of stuff can work really well so now you're combining the um, the proceduralism and the speed of uh, high frequency alphas yeah. along with like proper hand sculpting yeah we did a video on this a while back on how to actually do this with your sort of like make your own alphas and textures from uh, photos and if you're using that or you're using texturing xyc this is a good practice just because um, you can just help break up the the noise a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I really recommend that you're going in and sculpting, like sculpting it by hand. It also means that you get very clean maps as well, yeah. which you can use later on. Yeah, just to clarify, use the maps and then sculpt on top by hand. Yes. Um, don't sculpt all of this by hand. No. <laughs> no, if you were to sculpt all this by hand, you would lose your mind. Yeah. Also because you were talking 30 million pounds, <laughs> which is crazy. You would yeah. absolutely go insane. When it comes to symmetry as well, this is uh, this is something you can you can use symmetry for mostly the entire sculpt, but particularly like for the center line, you know, just maybe you want to break it up a little here. Yeah, you can see there are some slight breakups here, just to um, just to break it up a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. in general, you want to you want to work with symmetry when doing this, because you know there are different sides to it. You just it's impossible. You, you Unless you're going can't. through some weird black hole or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unless your dino is being distorted by time and space, then you aren't. <laughs> then you might have other problems. Exactly. But like this side and this side, you might be able to see it. Yeah. But for uh, for the majority of the sculpt, really just save your effort mm -hmm. and maybe have some areas. Yeah. Also, whenever you're doing setting this up as well for rendering, maybe set up rendering before you start going super crazy. Yeah. I, I keep doing test renders. Because then you can, maybe you want, you know, this angle here is going to be important and maybe something like this, then maybe you don't spend all your time on the belly. Yeah. You know, try to figure out what this is for. If this is for a portfolio piece, we aren't going to show every single angle. 
work from those angles. Mm -hmm. Honestly, doing an asset like this is really, really time consuming. So spend spend your time in a clever way. Yeah, there's no reason to do something on parts of it that you aren't going to th see just for the challenge of it, especially if you're doing a portfolio piece, because then you're probably on a, like a time constraint. Yeah, exactly. So let's look at the maps which are being used here, what we assume are the maps. <laughs> so if you go to surfacemimic.com, we were linking some of this in the description as well. Mm. These are these are most likely some of the maps which have been used here, because I recognize some of them from production. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much like texture artists just use the same maps. Yeah, exactly. Like every company just buys stuff off of Summer Surface Mimic and uh, texturing XYC, and then you know no reason to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, this uh, half of the characters or half of the Mega Kaiju <laughs> from Pacific Rim is textured with this specific <laughs> map here. Honestly, it's just so good because you can you have, there is so much variation in it. Yeah, and you can you can tile it across and you can project it and you can do tons of stuff. This is all like frog skin. So they have a bunch of different things on texturing XYC. Like same with this as well. Here you have some color maps. Mm. And this is what I use this a fair bit as well for texturing. These kind of things. So nice frog skin. The advantage of these is that they are tileable, which is really nice. Yeah. And then we have a text from XYC as well, where I find that the XYC maps are a bit better in terms of actual quality, like in terms of how how sharp they are and all that. They're really nice, but I find that the, the um, surface mimic maps are a bit more versatile. So, but these are of course really nice as well. Yeah. So if you're doing any kind of project like this, particularly if you if you're a small studio and you're starting up one of these, you know, just go to XYC and uh, Service Mimic and just spend a few hundred dollars on it. It's going to it's going to improve your speed like significantly. Yeah, it'll, it'll save you time and it'll also make your stuff look better. Yeah. Like because the free alphas or whatever you can find online is just not going to be as good as. I, don't, I guess like silicone molds or something taken off of stuff and then scanned or something. Yeah, nothing is coming close to it. So with all that said, let's jump into Mari and see what's going on here. So here we are looking at just a, the, the, the baked down color map. Yeah. The maps provider here is uh, it's purely color map. And here we can just see what's going on. When so what I was doing a lot when I worked in VFX was exactly this kind of stuff, was uh, creature texturing and I assume Damien has used a very similar technique to how I would texture this. The way I would do this is I would I would paint a very loose base. It may be using um, poly painting in ZBrush. Mm. That's an excellent way of doing it. You know, where you make the belly brighter, you make the top darker, you know, you, you make um, the horn dark here, you generally add some color values. It's just because hand painting in ZBrush is just a lot easier. Yeah. You know, it's like you have the brushes. I mean, you could probably even do it in stuff substance for, yeah, the, exactly. for the color map to start with. Exactly. So then you get a very loose and non-defined base here. Yeah. And then you can, of course, always paint it up later on. But then the real magic comes. You see all this high frequency stuff here. This this will all come from a displacement map. Mm -hmm. You you straight up in ZBrush extract the displacement map, and then you use that for masking purposes. Because because this, this way, everything in terms of the color actually lines up with what you've sculpted. Yes. So that really adds to the realism where the scales and skin sort of protrudes more. You can see it's kind of dark and then in the crevices it's lighter or whatever it is, you know. So so the color map and the sculpts will, will then match up. Exactly. So the way you can do that, you know, you, you would just make a new layer. You would paint you would paint a darker color from your base, yeah. but you would mask it out with this. It's kind of like having like masking tape where you're just, <laughs> you're just painting out or like a stencil. So this way you can get incredibly high frequency maps like this, because you I mean, same thing here, you're not gonna paint it by no. hand. And also they need to match up with what you have in ZBrush. Because yeah. you aren't just, you aren't texturing and then sculpting like as two separate operations. This is all very much in, in line with each other. Texturing and modeling goes very much hand in hand. Yeah. So if you are, if you're a texture artist, please talk to your modeler and <laughs> vice versa. Because <laughs> so, yeah. it's not like when you're a sculptor, you're like this superhero badass who just sculpts, works in isolation, and then hands up something to a texture artist. No. Like this was exactly what you, you, I remember you were doing on Pacific Rim. You really worked with the texture artist there. Yeah, I found that it helped a lot just with, like it's not so much for me personally in terms of what I want to do with the model and the UVs, but it's it's really like to optimize the the pipeline. So you know, I'd go to talk go talk to my texture artist, and just ask them which way do you prefer prefer your UVs to be laid out, uh, which direction do you want this, because that just enables them to paint faster. So any iterations that I would do could then go through them even quicker, and that sort of minimizes any bottlenecks in in the pipe. 
Yeah, I really find that UV mapping should be done by the text artist. Sure, yeah. the, the modeler can do all the dirty work and like do all the Do unfolded. all the cuts and stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't care so much about that. That just has to be done. Yeah. But in terms of actually doing the layout, I find the layout to be so important. Yeah. Because a good UV layout can can literally speed up your texturing by like 100%. If you work with an inefficient layout, mm -hmm. you are in so much pain. And if you work with a good layout, you're in a lot of you're in a very happy spot. For instance, if you want to like isolate this part here and you want to only work on this part, the way Damien has done this is awesome because you can click it and now you have this as a separate piece. You can yeah. hide it as well. But what I've seen sometimes and when I, when I had a bad layout is you click on this part and this is not isolated. Yeah, and maybe maybe like the other foot is in there as well, but it's disconnected. Yeah, you, you know, might so, have like this stuff. Yeah, that's really bad. <laughs> or parts of the tail is yeah. included. So, you know, especially for VFX, uh, it really doesn't matter about optimizing your UVs, no. honestly. Um, yeah, maybe for personal preference, you want to treat it a little bit like a puzzle. Sometimes mm. you're like, oh man, I, I think I can squeeze this into one UDEM less, which can be fun and frustrating. But like in terms of the layout, you just have to think logically about it. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the whole thing, if this one is connected to that thing, that is going to cause you so many issues. I mean, in Painter, or sorry, in Mari now, <laughs> it, when you're painting in Mari, it might be that, oh, you know, rats, I got to click one yeah. more thing. But this becomes a real, real issue the moment you are splitting your model up yeah. in something like ZBrush. Because a lot of time, if you, if you really need high frequency sculpting here, you might have to cut off the head. So then you you know you would select the head udims, and you would do this, and now you would cut off the head. Yeah. And in this case, this would work really well because the seam is right behind the head, mm -hmm. and it's it's really easy to to work with. But you know if if you're splitting off the head and you get a bit of the foot as well. Yeah, that's really annoying. Very very painful. As a as a side note there, uh, when when you're working on creatures for VFX and and you really need something that's super high res. Then you go in and you do this kind of splitting where you base it off of the UDIMs. That's like the easiest workflow because then you have a reliable way to select the same mesh over and over again. Mm. Once you split it up, you probably won't merge it together again. And then, you know, there will be instances where, oh shit, you sculpted over the, the, um, the border and maybe there's no way to get it back again. But that's not an issue. Because as soon as we apply our high frequency details from, let's say, Mario, we do some high frequency stuff there, any seam line just goes away because mm -hmm. of the noise. So it's actually a, like kind of a blessing in disguise yeah, exactly. with the high frequency there. Yeah, and also just to be clear, the reason we do want to split it up sometimes in production is just because you need just more resolution. Like maybe the head is this close up. Yeah. And like there's literally no way, like the entire thing is 30 million polys right now, which is awesome for like a render like this. Yeah. But if you have, I mean, for VFX, if you if you were to look at something like the dinosaurs from Jurassic World, mm. you know, you have shots which are essentially this close up. Yeah, and you probably need maybe maybe you'd need thirty just for the head alone. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, that's just a a, a restriction on uh, of ZBrush where you you aren't able to have like one hundred and eighty million for for one sub tool. Yeah, and exactly. And you probably don't want to. Also, in terms of like uh, the UDIM count, here we are dealing with eight UDIMs yeah. for the body, which is and they're four K which is really awesome for a personal project yeah. because it's it's enough to get quite high res. Like you, you can do renders of the head yeah. and it's going to look good, but it's also not going to break your machine. But for, for film, like, you know, when you, you need to plan for these shots, you you might be talking like 40 to 60 UDIMs, 8K around that. Yeah, and maybe in some instances over 100. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and, and once you go beyond creatures, for VFX like uh, environments or spaceships and stuff giant like that. Giant robots. Giant robots. You might have thousands of UDIMs. Yeah. So yeah. It's, uh, it can get pretty crazy Because then you have a shot which goes like this and it's going like this. <laughs> and it's slow slow motion and like you, every single area just needs to work like that. Yeah, that was a film we worked on where that hmm. happened. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what this was. <laughs> That's also one of the main differences why you would use Mari for uh, for film and Painter for games. Yeah. Because this is not even a discussion what, which one is better, has the best tools. It's which software can deal with the data. Yeah. Painter cannot deal with this. Doesn't matter what graphics card you have. And we don't want to hear anything in the comments about Painter support UDIMs because it doesn't. No, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't support uh, painting across multiple UDIMs. No. Yes, you can technically have UDIMs by different materials yeah. on the objects, but uh, this is where Mari outpaces Painter. 
In many, many ways, I think Painter is a much more solid painting solution. Mm. But in terms of the data that it can handle, Mari just beats it. And there's no discussion there. If I were to work on something like this again for production, I would never, ever use Painter for it. No. Like, this just... You can use it for the tileables. You know, you create the tileables in Painter, and then you import those into Mari and use them as tileables. But uh, that would probably be the extent of it. And you can also use Designer for some awesome base materials. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of the maps we saw here which have been in like XYC or uh, Surface Mimic, you could probably recreate something like that in Designer. Yeah. You could probably make something really cool there. Because, I mean, if you can make um, if you can make eggs <laughs> in, in it and like chapels. Dead and fish and entire villages, <laughs> you know, you can you make can do it. anything. But like, I just want to make it clear that for characters like this, Mari is really the tool you want to use. Yeah. Also, one cool thing as well is in terms of the UV layout, is that this here has laid, been laid out so that you can simply copy paste one over here. Yeah, see this was a, uh, we, oh man, we've had this, t- let's call it a talk many times, uh, just in companies and we, whenever you're working, like how do you do the UVs there mm. and with students as well. And we found that the way that Damien has done it here is the most optimal way. Because yeah. this way you can just take, let's say you, you have a hundred UDIMs um, and you did so 50 in total or per per side you simply just copy paste them don't flip don't invert don't do anything copy those 50 udems offset them by you know 100 up and and that way you can super easily just copy and paste your textures uh, this doesn't because you're technically your your textures that you've copied and and then moved are technically like if you look at them in maya they're not red so they're mm. inverted uh, but it doesn't affect your displacement maps. It doesn't affect, affect your normal maps. It doesn't affect anything. The only thing it affects is that if you paint in the 2D view, like if you write text in the 2D view, the ones that are red or flipped will be mirrored. Yes. That's the only downside to it. So we have a whole tutorial on this on yeah. YouTube as well where we show this. So like I just did here when Morton was uh, doing his little rant. I hope you, was, you were following along. So this means now we're missing half. Yeah. I've, I've simply filled this in gray. What you can do with this layout is if we do ortho and UV like this. The cool thing now is as this U, this side here is identical to this side, we just do control C. Ta-da! Control V. And, and just to I just wanna I just wanna highlight that this is a perfectly acceptable workflow. Yeah. We use it in VFX. <laughs> so it's you know, you can do it. It's totally <laughs> you fine. Can do it. So in this case, you know, you just do you just do this, you know, select this, control C, control V. No, just not go for just like the right one. <laughs> but what you can do, you can select all these guys, and then you can go to where is it? Uh, patches, copy textures, select a range, and and the offset count. Then you said OK, and ta-da! Yeah, this so, is instant. There was a what was there was another way that you guys used beforehand. It was like some script or something that mirrored the textures. Yeah, so and the, the, the way we used to do it beforehand, before we discovered covered, this yeah. method. Because it's it, been there for a while. Yeah, yeah this has been there forever. This is just a, a workflow issue. We used to flip these UVs. We flipped them hor- horizontally yeah. so that they would actually be correct. Because like you said before, these are technically now mirrored. Yeah. So now if you have text on it, you know that's a problem. Well, it's not a problem. You just got to be text. <laughs> exactly. So then you would go in here, and then you would patches, and you would you would mirror the textures. Mm. You would mirror it, transform, and flip horizontally. This took like an hour per 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 map to do because we dealt with sixty. Yeah. So the way you do UV, select them all, and just copy. Totally legit workflow. Super pro VFX tip. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that means you only have to paint one side of it. Yeah. And then maybe break up the center line. Exactly. And then let's look at Maya. So this is what the model looks like in Maya. And if you were to look at the topology, you would see it's very simple. Uh-huh. It's perfect, actually. Yeah. It's exactly what you need for uh, a creature. It's it's quadded. It's you know mostly uh, s- the same size of quads. Obviously, some places you need higher resolution. So it is what it is. Um, so this means you can, you can throw a sim on top of this. It's going to perform really well. In terms of rigging, it's going to deform really well. And uh, if you need more resolution, you simply subdivide it once or twice. Exactly. Very, very nice and easy to use. And if you want to do your own high frequency stuff, you can just use this as a base or, and you know, then go on with some mid frequency and, and do your own high frequency afterwards. Yeah, so if we wanted to show you just how simple this topology here is because a lot of times you see just absolute craziness, yeah. which some people do. 
The thing is, you don't necessarily want to bake in stuff like the wrinkles and topology. Like, let's say you 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 know you have like a wrinkle here. You don't necessarily want to bake this in. Like here, you can see it, but that's just because of the shape. Yeah. It's not cut in. If it's cut in, that means you are now fighting the muscle sim. Yeah. At every single step. So, you know, if you have something jiggle, which jiggles here, you know, you have some fat or you have some skin on top. Now a muscle sim is going to resolve that quite nicely. Where's but his genitals? I don't think he has any. Oh, right. Maybe it's like a Disney dinosaur. Yeah, because dinosaurs didn't have genitals. Right. As we all know. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Shh. Fair enough. <laughs> we have young people watching. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> So, you know, just keep this very nice and simple. Yeah. This is also why I'm advocating for not using sear meshing for this kind of stuff. Because honestly, doing this kind of stuff is it's really quite simple. You, know, yeah. you block out a very simple base and then you subdivide it, mm -hmm. conform it to it. And that means that you control the topology at every single level. Yeah. If you were to sear mesh this and now you're like, oh, we need some additional loops around it like this. You're like, oh man. That could be a nightmare. That would be, that's going to take a long time to do. But right now, you know, it's easy to add stuff. It's nice and even topology. Yeah. Nice and quadded. We have um, two layers of ice as well. Just a pretty simple one on the inside, a corny, uh, and then we have corny on the outside. Yeah, and that comes with the, I guess, the sculpted map as well from Seabrush. So. Yeah, exactly. So, I think we're getting to the end of this now. Mm. We've been talking for quite some time when it oh. comes to, about a dinosaur. <laughs> we just get really excited about dinosaurs. Yeah, about dinosaurs. So. If, if I were to sum all this up here, I would say that, you know, first start off with your fundamental sculpting. Start with, with you know, silhouette, yeah. get to mid frequency. And then for texturing, I would say if you have a good model with good mid frequency and then really awesome high frequency, the color mapping is, is quite easy to do. Yeah, because like so much of it just uh, is dependent on your spec and the level of detail in your high frequency map, then your color map can actually be pretty simple. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if you're seeing, even even when you're looking at this, it's still a complex color map, but it's it just comes from the high frequency. Yeah. It's just so much easier to do it this way. So I would say, you know, get your high frequency right, mm -hmm. use maps like XYC and Surface Mimic. Don't sculpt this kind of stuff by hand. And uh, unless, I don't know, you're a crazy person and you hate yourself, then yeah. go ahead. But uh, it is really a lot more efficient to do that um, with maps. Yeah, exactly. So we're looking at the shading of this kind of stuff. You know, you don't have to do anything crazy. No. Good sculpting, good high frequency, good color map. So yeah, we really hope you've enjoyed this breakdown and mad kudos to Damien <laughs> for providing this asset. Yeah, it's definitely. It's really cool. And like you can find this in in the Flip Normals asset store. Yeah. Link in, in the description. I mean, if, if you guys are interested in more of these kind of uh, breakdowns, whether it be personal pieces or, you know, some sort of media stuff, we talked about um, maybe breaking down some stuff from Netflix. What was it Love, Do Wrath, Death and Robots yeah, or something? Yeah, exactly. You know, having a look, having a look at that, uh, we'd be more than happy to. So, uh, you know, leave that down in the comments. Make sure to like and subscribe and turn on notifications so you get notified every time we put out a new video. Yeah. And send Damien nice wishes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys.